Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm really pleased today to have Dr. Sheila Mayoshi Yager on the podcast to tell us all about her fabulous new book titled The Other Great Game, The Opening of Korea and the Birth of Modern East Asia, published by Harvard University Press um, and pretty recently out in 2023. This book does so many things. It's an incredibly impressive piece of scholarship and really centers on helping us understand the emergence, the creation, um, the battles, the debates, the diplomacy around modern East Asia, helping us understand the central importance of Korea in all sorts of different movements between Russia, Japan, China, obviously Korea itself, um, and really makes the case that this period, these events um, deserve far much, far more attention in the historical understanding, especially in the West. Um, And I was pretty convinced of that already. And I'm way more convinced of that after reading this book. So Sheila, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast to tell us all about it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Before we dive into your fabulous book, would you mind introducing yourself a bit and explaining why you decided to write this? Yes. So I am a professor of Korean and East Asian history at Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. Um, Oberlin actually has a long um, history of relations with East Asia. Uh, Like many colleges and universities in in the United States, it actually started as a seminary school. Um, And Oberlin had a particularly rich history um, in sending uh, missionaries to China. Um, in fact, Oberlin is the uh, campus is the only place in the United States that houses a memorial uh, to those who died during the Boxer Uprising, the Memorial Arch. And that's relevant because I cover the Boxer Uprising in detail in my book. Um, in fact, 19 uh, Oberlin missionaries, along with countless Chinese, um, Chinese Christians, perished during the Boxer Uprising. Um, and so I made use of this, of this archive in my book. Um, as to why I decided to write the book... Well, having just finished my book on the Korean War, uh, entitled Brothers at War, I was curious to trace this conflict back to the earlier Korean wars that were fought in and around the Korean Peninsula in the late 19th and early 20th century. That is the First Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War. So like the Korean War setting um, half a century later, uh, the geopolitical situation in the late 19th and early 20th century East Asia also Um, involved similar problems surrounding a politically divided and volatile power that lay in the geostrategic center of the region, and that is the Korean Peninsula. Now, the parallels between um, post-1945 East Asia and um, pre-1894 East Asia are pretty striking, and I wanted to pursue um, this question in the other great game. Um, So, um, for example, um, in, in the buildup to the Russo-Japanese War, um, Britain proposed dividing the peninsula in half, in fact, um, with the Japanese in the south and the Chinese in the north in order to prevent the outbreak of the war. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, and then two years later, in 1896, um, uh, um, Yamagata Aritomo, who was one of the architects of the Meiji Restoration, he came up with this proposal to divide the peninsula at the 38th parallel, um, to settle this impending conflict between um, over Korea with the Russians. And of course, the Russians also proposed dividing the peninsula at the 39th parallel in 1903, just before the outbreak of the Russo-Japanese War. Um, so, you know, whether Dean, Bronst- uh, Dean Rusk and Charles Bronsteel, who were the two American officers who were responsible for drawing, actually drawing the line at the 38th parallel at the, at the end of the Second World War, um, were ever aware of this early history, um, isn't known. I don't. I've never come up with any evidence that they were, but it just goes to show Korea's central role in this interstate rivalry among the great powers um, that can really be traced back to the late nineteenth and early twentieth century. That makes sense that you would come to kind of having read the book and hearing that explanation. They fit very well together, um, but I think. Well, I've thought of many ways of trying to organize the many questions I have for you. Um, And I think in a lot of ways, the idea of starting uh, in the present and looking back makes a ton of sense kind of in terms of that curiosity, that, hang on, I want to go investigate this. Um, But I think maybe it would be easiest to answer that curiosity um, the way you do in the book, which is moving chronologically from the past to the present. 
So I'm going to try and do that, um, which means that we should start probably in the pretty obvious point of the very beginning of the book, which is in 1860. So why is that the starting point that you've chosen? Yeah, that's a a very good question. So the story begins in 1860, because this was this period of Russia's eastern expansion when Russia first came to share a border with Korea. So um, the Treaty of Peking, which was signed in 1860 between China and Russia, was really critical. And this was a period um, at the end of the Second Opium War, when China looked to Russia to help negotiate this treaty with Britain and France um, at the end of the Second Opium War. So in exchange, Russia came in possession of this huge swath of territory, which is the Amur and the Usuri regions. Um, It's roughly 400 thousand square miles, basically the size of Germany and France combined, that bordered northern Korea. And thus, it brought Russia in direct contact with Koreans for the first time in history. So by beginning the story or my book with Russia's eastward expansion, I place Russia really at the center of the changing regional dynamic among the three major Asian powers as they confronted each other over this non-power, which was Korea. So how Koreans, how the Chinese, um, how the Japanese reacted to this new Russian threat on Korea's border really is the starting point of my story. And, And this is really different. It's a very different starting point from most histories of this period, which really emphasize this East-West dynamic as the instigator for ch- of change. So, for example, the arrival of Commodore Perry, uh, Commodore Perry's black ships in Japan in 1853, or the period of the Sino-British confrontation right in the First Opium War in, of 1839-42. So by starting the history um, in 1860, my focus was really to write this, a distinctively regional history that is how Japan... China um, and Korea's reaction to this new Russian threat on Korea's northeastern border fundamentally changed the relationship between all um, three major Asian powers. Hmm. I guess listening to that explanation and reading it in the book, my response was, well, that makes a lot of sense. Why don't other histories um, start at that point? Um, But taking that as our beginning and thinking about this idea of threat and kind of response to it, Mm -hmm. moving first to China, this is the time of the Qing Empire, um, that famously had the strategy of, quote, using barbarians to control barbarians, right? Um, not quite getting their hands too dirty in other countries, but still maintaining control over it. How and why did the Qing Empire try and do this when it came to this sort of new situation and the entrance of Russia? You've got other Western powers coming in and the Qing Empire still very much wants to kind of have a lot of control over Korea. How does this strategy and their methods fit into this? Does it work? Yes. Yeah, so the term actually is using barbarians to control barbarians. Um, and, and this was a very ancient, you know, geopolitical uh, strategy that the Chinese employed, which basically means um, letting barbarians, so-called barbarians, right, barbarians fight it out amongst themselves, and then we can reap up the advantage. So the idea is that if both states A and B are our enemies, we can choose the less the less threatening enemy to be our friend, let's say, um, a, to fend off the larger threat, which is B. So um, like Mao Zedong uh, used this strategy in the 1960s at the height of the Sino-Soviet split. It, uh, Mao reached out to the Nixon administration, right? And the result was the 1972 Sino-American rapprochement, which was basically aimed to neutralize the Soviet Union. Um, so during the Qing dynasty, the the statesman Li Hongzang um, he tried the same strategy to protect Korea, he, basically to enlist a Western power, in this case, the United States, to establish relations with Korea, thereby deterring Russia from making any moves on the peninsula. And so that's why the United States was the first country um, to sign a treaty with Korea in 1882. So the idea was that China would continue to maintain its its traditional tributary ties to Korea as its suzerain. And then uh, for geographical and historical reasons, Korea and Japan would also be united in friendship. And then to deter other Western powers, namely Russia, Korea was to establish treaty relationship with the United States. And so this this strategy might have worked in principle, 
um, had it not been for Korea's very volatile domestic situation. So while the young Korean king, Kojong, adhered to this strategy um, and propo- you know, proposed by the Chinese, um, his father, the Taewangun, along with other cons- conservative Confucian elites, did not approve of Korea establishing relations with the so-called American barbarians. And they also strongly objected to formalizing new treaty relations with Japan, which had happened in 1876. And so um, the Taewangun, along with his supporters, his conservative supporters, raised this rebellion called the Emo Uprising in 1882, which completely upset the Chinese plans for Korea. And so the result was that China basically was forced to abandon its strategy of using barbarians to control barbarians, and then resorted simply to of taking control of Korea. So throughout the 1880s, Korea, China acted much more as a kind of like a modern imperial power than its traditional role as suzerain, which under the terms of the old you know, traditional tri, uh, tributary relationship had allowed Korea to have control over its own domestic affairs. Um, so when we talk about, you know, Japan's imperial conquest of Korea in, in 1910, we often forget that China acted like a similar imperial power in, in Korea in the 1880s. Hmm. Very interesting trying to kind of keep all the balls in the air, I suppose, um, and try and figure out what all the different groups wanted and how to respond to it. Thinking about that then, moving from what the Qing Empire was trying to do to Russia, um, That's obviously Russia's entrance into this area or kind of increased involvement is sparking a lot of this. What was Russia's Korea policy? Um, If we're thinking at this point, maybe we're in 1888. Um, And why were all the other countries, China, Japan, Korea and the US, why were they so bothered about Russia's Korea policy at this point? Well, actually, Russia didn't have a defined policy towards Korea um, during this period. Um, It you know, as I mentioned before, you know, Russia's big push to expand its empire into the Far East, um, which resulted in the Treaty of Peking in 1860, you know, it secured this huge region, the Amur and Yusuri region from China and brought Russia right to the border of Korea. Um, But then the Russians didn't really follow up after that. The Russians had acquired this huge expanse of wilderness, um, but there wasn't enough resources really to cultivate it. And so during the, the 1870s, Russia's main focus was really on Central Asia and playing the great game with Britain. However, by the 1880s, uh, the Central Asian kingdoms of Kiva, um, Bokhara, and Kokand f- had fallen, right, under Russian control. And it was at that point, sort of really in the mid-1880s, that Russia's attention once again shifts back to the Far East. Um, and this was Russia's second drive to the Pacific, right? And the focus now was became on populating the sparse region that the Russians had acquired from China in the 1860s. So transplanting these large numbers of Russians to this desolate land was not very populated, right? And developing this area for for commerce and trade posed obviously a very significant challenge and required the construction of a vast and extensive transportation system. And so this imperial project of bringing Russian power to this far off region of the world would be, you know, would become this enormous undertaking. And that's when the um, the great empire builder of the age, um, Sergei, Vita, Sergei Vita, comes into, um, into the picture. And he's actually a really important character in my book. Um, so Vita starts off his career as this railroad clerk, and then he rises to this, you know, to become the minister of finance. Um, and is, I, I think he's I think he's like 30, 43. Anyway, he's the youngest man ever to reach such heights in Russia. So the centerpiece of Vita's economic initiatives for developing the Russian Far East and really for building up Russia as a modern state was the Trans-Siberian Railway. Um, and the building of this railway was really to become the key instrument of Russian imperialism in Asia. So, it, you know, the the um, I'm sort of going off, but the Russian, the, the Trans-Siberian Railway really served sort of as this, would, would serve as a sort of flywheel for the entire Russian economy. You would have these extensive railroading um, constructions that would stimulate national growth, you know, by increasing demand for heavy industries, coal, steel, etc. The expansion of heavy industries would then in turn 
stimulate the growth of lighter industries, um, private companies, you would have communities that would be built up along the railway. And then through government intervention, these extensive subsidies by the state, um, Vita believed that the Trans-Siberian Railway would then ultimately raise the standard of living for the Russian people. So, so the emergence of you know this this Trans Siberian Railway that was coming across right to um, to, to through um, through Siberia, uh, bordering Korea, was obviously a very ominous development that Japan simply could not ignore, and so the you know the Japanese simply could not sit back and allow Korea to be threatened, you know by Russia, and that's why Japan proposed to China to embark upon a joint reform program for Korea. And so the first Sino-Japanese war was very much portrayed as this kind of enlightenment, uh, enlightened and civilizing Japan, right? Battling a decrepit and backward China for control to reform Korea, to make it, you know, t- strong, right? And so one of the slogans of the, of the time was that um, Japan was fighting for Korea's, you know, so-called reform and independence. And the idea was that Japan was supposed to make Korea an independent and strong nation, strong enough to be able to resist Russian encroachment. And of course, the irony is that Korea was supposed to be able to do all this by becoming, in a sense, a subordinate to Japan. And how did Korea feel about that? Uh, well, <laughs> there were there were uh, mixed responses to <laughs> to, uh, to it. There were there was a faction that that welcomed Japanese. Um, help. And there was another faction that uh, was very wary, obviously, of Japan. That would make sense. I think that's a pretty reasonable um, division to go, hang on a second, what's happening here? Um, But staying on Japan, right? Because Japan gets, all sorts of things are happening inside Japan. And I know I'm doing a horrible job of like, allowing you to go into domestic Japanese history at this point, which is fascinating. I will point listeners to the full book itself for all of the details that were glossing over because they really are interesting and fabulously written but staying with the sort of chronological highlights train that we're on um moving to 1894 you mark in the book you consider this a turning point for japan's relations with the rest of the world including russia and korea but not just them why is this year so crucial well, that was the outbreak of this, the the Sino-Japanese War. Um, and it was really a turning point, really, for the perception of Japan as this new rising power in East Asia. Right? It it won this 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 war against China, um, and and it, as I mentioned before, the war also was very much portrayed in the Western press as well as, of course, in Japan and around the world, as this conflict between a modern and enlightened Japan, you know, sort of battling a decrepit and backward China. Um, and so Japan's victory thus signified really the end of the old Sinocentric order that had been in place for more than a l- millennia, right, with China at the center. Um, and it uh, and now that you had a Japan-centric order, right, and, and it, it also very important had very important ramifications um, for Korea's domestic politics. Um, not only did Korea become permanently severed from China. But the war showcased uh, Japan now as the strong rising power in the region. And so many Koreans now look to Meiji Japan as this model to achieve Korea's own enlightenment and civilization. And these Koreans um, became part of the so-called um, enlightenment faction, what's called Kewadang. Um, and by contrast, there were other Koreans, including the Korean king and queen, um, who were not at all keen to follow Japan, right? They were very wary of Japan. And so this faction of Koreans aligned themselves with Russia at the, as the only power capable of standing up to Japan now that China was out of the picture. So ironically, after Japan managed to sever Korea's relationship with, with China following Japan's victory in the Sino-Japanese War, the Ch- J- Japanese now had to contend with Russian influence in the in in um, in Korea, the very reason, in a sense, one of the main reasons that Japan went to the war was because of of this looming Russian threat, right, with the Chinese, with the Trans Siberian Railway. So Russia hadn't fired a shot during the war, but it was now poised to reap all the benefits of the war by allying itself with this pro-Russian Korean court, and so that's the context behind. Um, the Japanese minister's decision to come up with this plan to assassinate the queen, Korean queen in 
um, October 1895. So she was colluding with the Russian minister in Korea, Karl Weber, to undermine the Japanese. Um, and so not long after her murder, the Korean king, Kojong, then escaped to the, the Russian legation in February um, 1896, where he orders the execution of all his pro-Japanese ministers. So by 1896, the Korean government was effectively being run out of the Russian legation. And so you can imagine how frustrated the, the Japanese were, were, were. You know, they had just fought this war to oust the Chinese from power in Korea, only to have the Russians move in into the peninsula without having a shot being fired. So if Russia really had the will to make Korea a protectorate at that time, it could certainly have done so. However, at that time, the Russians were focused really on building this trans, the Trans-Siberian Railway, right? And so they were negotiating this deal with the Chinese to build part of that railway across Chinese territory, that is through Manchuria. Um, that's called the Chinese Eastern Railway. And so that's why the Russians then signed this agreement with Japan in 1896, basically affirming both countries' mutual rights in Korea. It was also at this time... Um, in 1896, that Yamagata Aritomo famously you know, proposed that the Korean Peninsula be divided at the 30th parallel. And while this proposal was rejected by Russia at the time, the idea of the 30th parallel was later resurrected um, at the end of World War II, right, by the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, and we can speculate that this was why Stalin agreed to divide the peninsula at the 30th parallel when the Americans proposed it, because Stalin knew that Russia might have avoided war with Japan way back in 1904 if Tsar Nicholas had agreed uh, to the proposal back in 1896, um, and he wasn't going to make the same mistake. Mm, very consequential then for divisions within Korea. Um, and obviously you've mentioned it, and the stage is pretty obviously set, right, given what's happening in 1896 for Russia and Japan to have some issues. And in fact, as you've just mentioned, we do have the Russia-Japanese War not many years later. What impact did this war have on relations, um, not just between Russia and Japan, but also between Japan and China and Korea and Japan? If Russia and Japan are now sort of going, if, if Japan is going, wait, I, we just tried to get China out of Korea. Now Russia's turned up. Hang on a second. This isn't necessarily going to go very well. We then, as you've mentioned, have the Russia-Japanese War in 1904. Um, what impact did that have on kind of how all these different actors interact, right, between Japan and China, between Korea and Japan? Um, it's not just, obviously, the Russia-Japanese War, as you talk about in the book, is not just about Russia and Japan. Um, right. Well, as I said, um, I because uh, I um, obviously the Russia Jap the so you're you're asking what the Russia Japanese War uh, the impact of the Russia Japanese War not the Sino Japanese War had on uh, uh, Korean domestic politics. Yeah. So um, that's. Um, that's a big question. So the Russia-Japanese War obviously had a huge impact on Korea because once Russia was out of the picture, Japan was able to take position of Korea and then make its it, its protectorate. Um, Russia also lost control over the conduct of its foreign affairs. Um, as for Japan's relations with China after the Russia-Japanese War, that's a more complex question. So one of the... Um, the main argument of the book is that the Russo-Japanese War became this turning point um, in the direction of Japan's foreign policy and grand strategy. Um, and this question basically comes down to this. Um, should Japan take a continental route or a maritime route to great power status? Um, and it should be uh, remembered that up to 1905, Japan very much saw itself as a maritime power. Um, so during the Sino-Japanese War, Japan's leaders pursued what was then um, called the Southern Strategy or Nanshin by occupying, um, undertaking the occupation of Taiwan. Japan's leaders did not pursue a Northern Strategy, Advanced Strategy, a Hokushin that is advanced towards Manchuria. There, there was, in, in other words, no plans to take Beijing. Um, so, so, if, so for example, when um, General Yamagata Aritomo, who was the commander of the First Army, he dis disregarded um, Prime Minister Ito Hirobumi's warning not to advance north, right, and occupy the city of Haicheng. 
Um, Ito then directly appealed to the emperor, who promptly recalled Yamagata from the field. Um, the Japanese troops also withdrew all their troops uh, from China after the Russia, uh, the Sino-Japanese War. In other words, Japan's path to achieving great power status was very much as a maritime power, um, and which made sense because Japan is um, an island nation. Moreover, in the buildup to the Russia-Japanese War, Japan sought alliances and friendships with the world's great maritime powers, that is Britain and the United States, and it embraced the principles of the open door. Of course, this was also the period of uh, U.S. imperial expansion after this, the Spanish-American War, when the U.S. secured um, the Philippines. It also took Wake Island, um, Hawaii, and Guam, and the so-called coaling stations, right, to secure trade and commerce with China. So by aligning itself with Britain and the United States, the Japanese also saw themselves as a rising um, great commercial power, great commercial and maritime power. And moreover, after uh, uh, Jap uh, Admiral Togo's great victory in the Battle of Tsushima, um, which was the last great battle of the Russo-Japanese War, um, that was far greater and more spectacular than anything that General Oyama had achieved in Manchuria. And so that victory enhanced the Navy's visibility. So after 1905, um, the Navy Minister Yamo uh, Yamamoto began to advocate a number of new policies aimed at furthering Japan's status as this great maritime naval power, you know, selling fleet expansion, etc. And some naval officers even advocated abandoning uh, Japan's continental holdings in Manchuria and Korea altogether in order to focus on Japan's maritime and commercial approach to national power. But Japan's army leaders obviously vociferously objected, and they, you know, too much blood and treasure had been lost in the hills and valleys of Manchuria for Japan to, to abandon Manchuria altogether. And so they argued that Japan could not give up its foothold in the continent. Um, and ultimately, a compromise was struck. Um, but the bottom line is that Japan's armed forces were not withdrawn from Manchuria after the war. Um, this situation then lead, led to deepening tensions with China, but it also led to worsening relations between the Japan and the United States, which had its own trade interests in Manchuria. So by 1907, um, Japan essentially had turned its back to its commitment to the open door. It signed this new treaty with Russia in 1907 and 1910, which essentially secured Japan's rights and influence in southern Manchuria in exchange for recognizing Russia's rights in Manchuria and northern Man and, and Mongolia. Um, now, so, you know, then, then you have the outbreak of World War I in Europe, further deepening tensions between China and Japan. Um, you know, Japan goes in and it, it occupies Shandong. It also sends uh, troops to Siberia. So all these developments later set the stage for, um, for the events that would engulf Japan in the 1930s. So my point here is that the shift in Japan's focus from seeing itself as essentially as a maritime power to a continental power with stakes in Manchuria really came about at the end of the Russo-Japanese War, when these arguments about the direction of Japan's foreign policy became hotly debated. And so one of the reasons that I devote you know, three whole chapters to the Russo-Japanese War was really to showcase um, the, the tremendous blood and sacrifice of that war and, um, and to show how hard it was for Japan really to withdraw from Manchuria. Mm. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned kind of the amount of detail and why you chose to make that such a focus. Um, I think it really comes through in reading the details in the book, like this is a big deal. Um, and we need to remember that. So thank you for sort of including that kind of your thought process in making that point. I wonder if we can, given how big a deal it was, right, and the consequences of it, um, could you tell us a bit more about the consequences and legacies of this war, the Russo-Japanese War, within Japan, now that we've heard a bit about um, its impact on Japan's relations with other countries? Yeah, so well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, Admiral Togo's victory in the Battle of Tsushima, uh, which essentially ended the Russo-Japanese War, um, was far greater, had far greater, was more spectacular than anything that General Oyama had achieved in Manchuria. And so that victory really enhanced the Navy's um, visibility. And naturally, this gave rise to this intense inter-service rivalry between the Army and the Navy, 
And so one of the major consequences of the war domestically was this Army-Navy competition um, with the Navy looking at a maritime commercial um, view to, towards great power, um, Army being more continental, right, continental great power. Um, but the settlement of the Russo-Japanese War also gave rise to tensions between the military and civilian leadership like Ito Hirobumi, who believed that it was necessary to withdraw uh, Japan's armed forces from the continent to maintain good relations not only with China, but with the United States. So along with this um, this inter-service rivalry between the Navy and the Army, you also had these tensions between the military and civilian leaders over the direction of Japan's foreign policy that also came to a head after the war. Um, and of course, these tensions were also exacerbated by this huge disappointment that the Japanese people felt about what had happened at Portsmouth, um, the Portsmouth Treaty, which ended right um, the the Russo Japanese War with Russia. Um, so the, the idea was that you know the Japanese military had won the war and the politicians had lost the peace, and so there was this huge sort of um, anger um, and these anti peace riots that that happened um, at the end of the war. Portsmouth obviously was really important. Um, can you tell us more about what happened there, why it was so disappointing to Japan, and then perhaps how this impacted Japan-Korea relations in particular? Um, yeah, so um, many people, many Japanese people were were, were very angry after the war um, because they had sacrificed so much, right? Um, and not only that, Japan had won every single battle against the Russians. They just could not understand um, how Foreign Minister Kimura could have not secured the promised war indemnity. Um, they were promised this war indemnity and they didn't get it. And not only that, the Japanese also had been forced to withdraw from northern, uh, from northern Sakhalin when the entire island had been occupied by Japanese forces in July. So for them, it was, it was un- incomprehensible. And of course, what the public did not understand is that General Kuropakton, um, the who was running things, the general in um, in the head of the Manchurian army, um, he was later sacked. But um, what the Rus- basically his whole um, strategy was to play a war of attrition. And so by 19 spring of 1905, the Japanese forces by this time were really exhausted, and of course what the Russians had going for them was time. Time was on their side, not on the Japanese side. Eventually, the idea was that um, there would be enough troops arriving from European Russia to eventually throw the Japanese out of Manchuria. And so the Japanese leaders knew, understood that they needed to seek peace sooner than later. Um, what, and, and of course, the Japanese people did not understand this. And so you had these huge riots in Hibiya Park, following the announcement of the signing of the Portsmouth Treaty. Um, As for how the treaty impacted Japan's relations with Korea, well, Japan forced um, King Kojong then to sign a protectorate treaty, which basically meant that Koreans lost their national sovereignty um, and the right to conduct their nation's foreign affairs. Mm, Very consequential indeed. How then does this impact the divisions that you've already mentioned were um, present in Korea already from, from the end of the Sino-Japanese War um, with the, <laughs> the king ending up in the Russian legation and running the country from there? How does this settlement of the Russo-Japanese War um, impact those divisions? Hello. So um, one of the central themes of the book um, is to trace... Um, the current national division uh, of Korea back to its origins in the late 19th century, uh, late 19th and early 20th century. So um, unlike most standard works, which view the origins of the division arising from the Japanese colonial period, um, colonial period being 1910 to 1945, I really see a definite split in the um, Korean national movement occurring right after uh, or during, actually, the Russo-Japanese War. But but really, the split happens, I think, in 1907, um, after the forced abdication of, of King Kojong um, and the subsequent disbandment of the Japanese-trained Korean army um, that same year. And I think that Russia had a much larger, greater role in the creation of these you know, Korean divisions than had been previously identified. So 
Um, what happened is after the forced disbandment of the Korean army in 1907 by the Japanese, you had thousands of Korean soldiers who had been trained by the Japanese. They fled the peninsula to the Russian Far East, where they joined members of um, the Uibyang or the Righteous Army. Now, the Uibyang or the Righteous Army were guerrilla forces that were based in Vladivostok and other places in the Russian Far East. And they had joined up with the Russians to fight against Japan during the Russo-Japanese War. And so by 1907, you have this influx of well-trained Korean soldiers who joined up with Korean soldiers who'd been trained by the Russians. And so that's the context really for the signing of the Russo-Japanese Treaty in 1910. The Japanese needed Russia's help to suppress these Korean guerrillas who were concentrated in the Russian Far East. Um, and for in exchange, Russia wanted free reign in Northern Manchuria and Mongolia. So the 1910 Russia-Japanese Treaty was, was really significant in this regard because Russia completely reversed its support of Korean partisans and now began to round them up and to arrest them. Um, now, following the outbreak of um, World War I in 1914, Russia then an initiated a further crackdown on these Korean partisans as Russia sought to strengthen its ties with Japan to act against a common enemy, Germany. However, the October Revolution of 1917 changed the calculus um, once again. And so following Russia's withdrawal from the war, right in March uh, 1918, right with the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, the new Bolshevik regime then cut its ties with Japan and then started to give support to the Korean guerrillas and to anti-Japanese organizations. And then you had the Russian Civil War, which also provided this occasion for the Russians and the Koreans to work together again in the Russian Far East. Um, and that's because the Bolsheviks needed allies and Korean militants helped them mount a second front against the Siberian expedition to which Japan contributed a large force. So basically for a second time since the Russian-Japanese War, the Russians and the Koreans were fighting against Japan. Um, you had immigration to um, to the Russian Far East increased in the 1920s, and you had this large number of Koreans that were concentrated in Vladivostok. However, there were other Koreans that took a completely different path. So in 1907, also, that marks the beginning of the Protestant revival movement in Korea, when thousands of Koreans, mostly in the northwestern provinces, for example, Pyongando and Pongedo, they convert to Christianity. Around the same time, you have Korean immigrants in um, Hawaii and San Francisco. Um, they came together to work for their nation's you know, independence. Now, these Koreans, these Christian Koreans, were much more focused on attaining Korean independence through a program of national self-strengthening. Um, many were also Christians, as I said, um, and they, you know, they learned English in, uh, in American missionary schools. So by 1913, you have this noticeable division between these two groups that was becoming apparent. You have a radicalized faction allied with the Bolsheviks and a much more moderate faction made up of Korean Christians. Now, after the March 19th, 19 movement, there was this attempt to unify these two groups by establishing the Korean provisional government in Shanghai, but the um, the effort ultimately failed. And so by the end of the Second World War, you basically have these two main groups vying for power. You have, and so the, the division of the peninsula at the 38th parallel, in a sense, reinforced a divide that it was already developed during the first decades of the 20th century. You had capitalists and Christians in the South, led by a Korean Christian, Sigmund Rhee or Lee Sing Man. And then you had Bolshevik Bolshevized Koreans and socialists in the north, which was led by Kim Il Sung. So the division of the peninsula, although you know, sort of crudely drawn at the 38th parallel by the United States and the Soviet Union, I say actually traces its origins in the years following the Russo-Japanese War, um, or even earlier. Mm. Fascinating. Thank you for helping us trace the consequences and legacies. Um, I think that often when this topic is taught, um, kind of understanding how all those pieces go together is often missed out. And I think that's one of the such a crucial thing that you're doing in this book. Um, we've 
kind of moved chronologically over quite a decent chunk of time, which is very helpful. So I'm wondering if maybe as a penultimate question, um, you could help us think through some of the main legacies, obviously one of them being helping us really understand this division between today, North and South Korea. Um, some of the main legacies of this other great game in Asia? Well, I think there's a, um, a short-term le- legacy and a longer-term legacy. I think the short-term legacy was the widespread regional violence and instability that occurred um, as a result of Japan's rise as um, the new imperial power in Asia. And one can say that the struggle for empire in the late 19th century really helped give rise to the crisis of the 1930s and the coming war. Um, And in this sense, I agree with the historian Richard Overy when he says that the Second World War um, is really better understood as as a conflict over empires and not as this, you know, sort of titanic struggle between good and evil. And that's because um, the roots of global violence really can be traced back um, to the last decades of the 19th um, and early 20th century when this, you know, when the pace of economic and political modernization um, really quickened, right? in the developing world and particularly in East Asia. So um, the focus of uh, on 1914 as sort of the end of peace, I think is is misleading because the world was already really destabilized by large scale conflicts, right? Like the Sino-Japanese war and the Russo-Japanese war before World War I. And and so in this sense, I think World War II was actually a continuation of the other great game or, you know, after all, you know, after the Sino-Japanese War, Japan never rel- relinquished its rights in Manchuria. Um, as for the long-term legacy, I tend to agree with those analysts who argue that um, we're entering into this new multipolar era heightened by competition between two or more great powers. Um, and in this sense, I think this new era is similar to what happen during the other great game. That is, you have these great powers doing what they've always done by furthering their own national interests. Um, that said, I think um, I think the main difference um, between this new era of great power politics and the one that I wrote about in my book is that today's revisionist powers are really all about the settling of old scores. You know, for China, Taiwan is linked to this devastating period when it's forced to relinquish, right, both China, uh, Korea, and, and, and Taiwan to Japan, thus effectively ending its hegemonic position in as the great, as the middle kingdom. As for Russia, it's about, you know, the humiliation suffered at the end of the Cold War and the right to reclaim any territory that belonged to the former Tsarist empire. Um, so it's really sort of going back to this period before um, during the Great Game to sort of to, to find when when China was the the the, the center, right? And during the, the Tsarist period, when China, when Russia was also a great power. Um, so beyond um, Russian and and Chinese revanchism, I think that American and European responses to the current moment is also pretty instructive, because this new buzzword in American um, and European political circles is this concept of de-risking, right, which means reducing dependency on China for essential goods and commodities. Um, And I think such ideas once again demonstrate that we're entering into this new multipolar geostrategic landscape with, of course, a familiar player, Korea, being caught once again in the middle. You know, so despite the friendly relations between, um, you know, um, President Yoon suk yeol who came, you know, met with Biden a few months ago, South Korea has actually been very reluctant to submit to UN pressures to help arm Ukraine, right? Um, um, and, and South Korea has also been much more circumspect than other Americans to distance itself from China. Um, unlike Japan, it has not imposed curbs on semiconductor technology sales to China. And, and of course, all this is understandable because China is South Korea's largest trading partner and um, supply chains for some of South Korea's most important industries like semiconductors are largely China based. So Washington's efforts to isolate China is extremely problematic for South Korea. So all this underscores how the story of the other great game really continues to cast this long shadow on the current geopolitical moment from Chinese and Russian revanchism and sort of to return to this period when they were great um, to um, 
Korea's familiar role of, of being squeezed, you know, between these great powers. Mm. That's yet another fabulous reason um, for listeners to want to pick up the book. It does explain so much, much of, of what we're seeing now. Com- uh, Korean politics, it does. It really does. Contemporary Korean politics, but also East Asian relations. Um, What China, you know, a lot of current Chinese politics hearkening back to the past. This is very much a piece of that. Um, Japan still trying to figure out the balance between remembering and continuing. Um, And there's so many pieces here, in addition to it also being the book, a fabulous piece of historical scholarship of just figuring out what actually happened and going into the details of it and putting all the pieces together. Um, So thank you for summing all of those things up and bringing us not just up to the present, but really kind of helping us understand the future. Um, That leads really nicely to my final question, which is, I admit, less geopolitical, um, but still future oriented. Now that this book is done, is there anything you might have your eye on next, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on this exact topic that you'd like our listeners to be aware of? Well, actually, this book was conceived as um, as the first volume of a four volume project on war and conflict in East Asia. That is from the end of the second opium war to the Korean War. Um, so now that I'm finished with volume one, um, which really goes up to 1910. I'm currently working on volume two, um, which is tentatively entitled The Great War in East Asia. And so my main argument here is that World War I had this tremendous impact, not only in relations between China, Japan, Korea, and and Russia, um, but the war also further deepened the internal political divisions within these countries. Um, So the battles that took place um, in Manchuria and Siberia between 1914 and 1922, which is the end of the Russian Civil War, um, may not have been as costly as those that took place on the European and Eastern Front, but their impact on the region was was really tremendous. Um, So it'll be another big book. I love writing on large canvases with lots of compelling personalities. Um, Volume three will then take uh, go up to the Second Sino-Japanese War, which merged with World War II. And then this series will conclude with my last book, which I already wrote, Brothers at War, which is volume four, about the ongoing Korean War, which will bring the story up to the present day. Wow. Well, very exciting. Um, I can't wait to see what you do with those books. But of course, in the meantime, while you're working on them, listeners can read the one we've been discussing, The Other Great Game, The Opening of Korea and the Birth of Modern East Asia. Sheila, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It was, it was nice to talk to you. 